So, for example, if I'm going to define a prime number, I could use the word number, and that's not a problem because the definition of prime number assumes we all, that the definition of number is already settled upon. The problem with the definition of set is that we have no prior assumption. We have no, when we set up these axioms, we have no prior concepts. So set is a sort of primitive concept. It's the first concept, and we have nothing to define it with. Um, so this leaves us in an awkward position. Maybe that doesn't seem like such a big problem, but it does raise some questions like, how do we even know what a set is? And the answer is we're forced to rely on our intuition. We have to say, oh, well, we sort of we get what a set is, even though we can't define it. Okay, so then this raises another question. What if we were to drop one of the eight axioms, the standard eight axioms? What would happen to math then? And the answer is it would produce a whole bunch more questions like the continuum hypothesis that I mentioned. Questions that would no longer have answers. Answers with questions that before you could say were true would suddenly cease to be true, or here I'm using true to mean derivable from the axioms. Uh, and they would cease to be true because you sort of like lost an axiom, so you've lost some statements that you can talk about. And what if we added an axiom? Well, the continuum hypothesis is an interesting example, but that, that's an axiom that's independent of the other axioms. Let's say we added an axiom that wasn't independent. And by independent, I mean that like, those original axioms can say nothing about the continuum hypothesis, and the continuum hypothesis can say nothing about those axioms. But what if we added an axiom that's not independent? That, in that case, one of two things will happen. Either the axiom is redundant, so we, you know, sort of, it's already built into the other axioms, and then we, then we can just ignore it because it doesn't do anything, it doesn't change anything. Uh, we can use Occam's razor to say, oh, just forget about it, it's not important. Or we can go and we can add an axiom that, that contradicts those first axioms. And that leads to really bad things. Now it turns out that, what, so what do I mean by contradicts? What I mean is that you could derive, if we had an axiom that contradicted the first eight, that means that you could derive any statement you wanted in the system, any statement whatsoever, and you could derive it and say it's true. So what that means is basically, like any system that's, that has, if the, sorry, let me say this again. If there exists a contradiction in a system, then any statement whatsoever can be derived. So that means that if, if our base, eight basic axioms had a contradiction, we could derive the statement 1 plus 1 equals 3. So you have to be careful, therefore, of adding new axioms, because if you added a new axiom and it's not independent of the first ones, and it happens to contradict them, then suddenly statements like 1 plus 1 equals 3 can be proven, and that seems really bad. Now, we would all like to say that our eight axioms that we currently have don't have that problem. Like, of course math is not self-contradictory. Of course you can't prove 1 plus 1 equals 3, right? Well, the answer is wrong. In fact, it's, it's wrong in a very deep sense. It turns out that mathematicians have never been able to, to show that you can't prove 1 plus 1 equals 3 from the axioms, from those eight basic axioms. But it gets even worse than this. Not only have mathematicians not been able to show it, it's been proven that you could never show that 1 plus 1 equals 3 is not derivable from the axioms. Why is that? Well, this now gets to uh, something called uh, the incompleteness theorem, created by this fellow named Gödel. Gödel is an interesting character in his own right. Um, he actually was afraid of being poisoned to death. And, uh, and so his wife would actually taste his food to try and protect him from the poison that he imagined. And when she ended up sick in the hospital, he starved himself to death. But prior to that, he was a great mathematician, and he came up with this inc incompleteness theorem where he proved that uh, any consistent system, meaning any consistent math any system without contradictions, that's sufficiently complex to sort of model arithmetic, you, it can never prove itself consistent. Meaning that if you were to come up with a proof that math is consistent, that would actually mean the math is inconsistent because any consistent system can never prove its own consistency. So in, in this particular case, if we were to ever show that 1 plus 1 equals 3 uh, is not a true statement, that would actually imply that math is consistent. Uh, the reason it would imply that is because if math was inconsistent, it could prove any statement, including 1 plus 1 equals 3. So if you show that it can't prove that 1 plus 1 equals 3, then it must be consistent, but that violates the incompleteness theorem, which says that a, a consistent system can never show its own consistency if, it, if it's powerful enough to model arithmetic. So we're left in this very awkward situation where we can't even say with 100% confidence that 1 plus 1 equals 3 is not a true statement. So 
This sort of leads me to the end of my talk, or just to review the ways that we question 1 plus 1 equals 2. I mean, so on the, on, to start with, we, many people believe that you can verify something like that empirically. You can look at the real world and say, oh, putting balls in a bag leads to 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's not true. 1 plus 1 equals 2 was designed to model that situation. We invented those concepts because they model that situation. In fact, it's interesting to think about what does 1 plus 1 equal 2 really model? It's not modeling the, the color of the balls or the position of the balls. All it's modeling is one particular aspect, the grouping and quantity properties of the balls. So it's really designed to model a very specific aspect of the real world. So that's the first way you might try and justify 1 plus 1 equals 2, and that, that doesn't seem to work out so well. Second way is you might seem to, you might go back to the axioms and say, okay, well, we've got these axioms. We can prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2 from the axioms. That, that actually is true, and it's pretty easy to prove it. But in order to make that argument, you have to justify the axioms. Um, the only real justification for the axioms is that they give us the math that we were used to, the math that we developed prior. But because that math was only developed because it was good at modeling the real world, it, it was more like a language than anything else. It was a descriptive language for modeling situations. Um, so it's hard to justify from the axioms uh, that just because 1 plus 1 equals 2 is provable from the axioms doesn't mean that it's actually true in some deep fundamental sense. And this whole business about the ninth axiom seems to also call things into question because it says there can be disagreement with, about which axioms are true. Which axioms should we accept? If we, if we add a new axiom, we get a different flavor of math. If we remove an axiom, some statements are no longer provable. Um, so it really, on a deep fundamental level, I think 1 plus 1 equals 2 being a true statement, the best way to justify it, in my mind, is, is a pragmatic justification, saying this is a very useful construct that it models the world in many situations, and we, we can apply it in just those situations, and then we can show that it worked by checking our solution, checking the real world and verifying that it really did work. Um, so what do, okay, but mathematicians talk about truth a lot. They say, oh, this theorem is true, this theorem is false. What do they mean by that? Well, what mathematicians mean by that really is that they have a set of like of theorems that they can or and mathematical objects that they take for granted. They assume this theorem is true. They assume that that this mathematical object exists. And when they say that some other theorem is true, all they mean is that you can apply deduction to go from those prior theorems they've assumed to be true to that new theorem. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine because those theorems have been shown, the ones that they rely on, the basic math knowledge that all mathematicians know, that's been shown to work really, really well at modeling the world around us. And any theorem derived from them, therefore, also, in some sense, is, has that same pragmatic justification. It's relying on theorems that work really well at modeling things. That's all I have to say. Thank you.